<laughs> oh, the flip. Wait, what? No! No, come on, this is two seconds into the game! What the Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time. Hold it. Just like Ninja Gaiden, someone is there asking, Why, K-Bash, where's the old games? The modern Prince of Persia games came straight out of Ubisoft after they snatched up the license. The dev team made a point of avoiding any mention of Prince of Persia 3D, any reference to the games of yore. Sands of Time alone went on to become one of the legends of the sixth generation of consoles. It's got the goods, it's got the looks, it's a self-contained trilogy, and that's what I'm focusing on today. The Prince of Persia trilogy is pretty simple, you know? You see this guy running around? Oh, it looks innocent, but if you haul up the flagstones, it's crawling with quality, attention to detail, harmonious elements, and an absolute infestation of jank. It's amazing. I won't lie, I love these games. The dev history is real well documented, and it's apparent that the trilogy is a product of intense consideration, Herculean effort, and a boatload of cash. It's the story told in three acts of a classic born again and rapidly crushed under the weight of financial pressure. But enough about the noise, all that writerly crap. We got three games here on the cutting board. Let's get shopping. Sands of Time. <laughs> Let's get turned up. For the sands of time slipping away every second. Oh, God. It's the tale of the prince who was never named in game ever. Huh. And Farah who totally thought she could fix him. <laughs> oh, you. While Prin. Pop, okay? It's Pop now. While Pop is faithful to the originals in many ways, platforming and swashbuckling, the Arabian Nights setting, etc., it feels totally fresh. It's got that clean 2000s look of protagonist to compete with Link, with the poutingest lips, the Matt Mercer cut, but you don't gotta look that good until later. You get the dweeb fit to start. Yeah, okay. The real spin, above anything, is the clock hands, the rewind mechanic. See, it's like this. Huh. You know, I have not been painting Nearly an- OH SHIT! Oh, no problem. Rewind time! Oh shit. I think if any non-gamer wanted to get into 3D games, period, pops the place to start. It's a game that gives you a redo on a button. I would've killed for that oh! shit beautiful Joe. And it's not totally broken, right? There's a sand meter, you can only rewind so much, so you use it to fix bad inputs, little mistakes. Oh god! Sometimes you'll pop it to win combat and complete puzzles, sure, but damn, such a simple feature increases playability so much. You can actually just sit down and enjoy the thing, and that's saying a lot. I play lots of games, very few err on the side of the player more than the director or designer. That's not a shot at the design either. Things elegant, flowing, sand in the glass, it's always introducing a concept, building it up, adding and remixing. I think any designer would be proud to have their name in the credits. It's a platformer, but with such a basic set of actions. Run, jump, Climb, wall run, swing, roll, outside of bending time, you don't do a whole lot. That doesn't make sense for the prince here. Your controls and his body, his reality, are totally in sync. It's an intuitive experience, better than most, and almost never necessitates a guide or a pause unless you're stuck on one of the few object puzzles. You know, things external to the prince's body. Insert extremity joke? Sure, it's not perfect, it's young tech, and for as basic as it looks, there's a lot of money backing it up. Things like cloths reacting to the prince, uh, quality lighting, drinking water for health anywhere water naturally occurs. Bro, people bathe there. Cinematic camera angles, uh, being able to interact with other bodies on screen. I'm sure the team had significant problems getting all the systems up and working. Admittedly, the original Xbox Ninja Gaiden was released only a year after with some extreme extremely impressive technical work, enough to make this thing feel doughy by comparison, but that game's incredible today. So, I just can't stop gushing about the game flow. It's like playable candy. You'll hit up a new segment, blaze on through the obstacles, have a combat section, hit a harder obstacle course, but it's never too much. You've always got access to rewind. You can fix your mistakes. Oh god! So you can keep at anything and pull through eventually. Just make sure you're actually packing sand and uh, you line up your jumps. 
Yeah, that's on me. And occasionally it'll throw up a perfect roller coaster segment, just you in like two minutes of straight, intuitive platforming. I know the game's only telling me I'm pretty, but I'm such a slut. But you know, the combat catches a lot of flack, and I can see why. <laughs> Actually, that's not even the half of it. Sands of Time's a good Christian game. There is no blood to speak of. You're fighting sand zombies. Yeah, I'll talk about it later. But what that means is that Combat's only draws the animations. It looks cool, but he's got his scimitar up, slashes away, jumps on enemies like he's yeah. f***ing Aladdin or something. He's cool to watch. I think the problem people run into is how bad it feels. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of tech junk in the background making combat fuzzy, right? Where Ninja Gaiden successfully had men flying off walls, you can't interact with the environment at all during combat unless you're forced into it. Usually because you've flung yourself off someone, so you're stuck on the ground. Movement's slowed and constrained. You can roll and jump and that's about it. You're constantly surrounded by groups of enemies. The game's careful to only spawn so many at a time, but you gotta fight down hordes, like 15, 20, guys per fight at times, and they're always blocking, sweeping the ground, going out of their way to make your life harder. It gets pretty sluggish by mid-game. And that's to say nothing of the... <laughs> Jank? It's a janky old game. Basically, it's playing at action game, but most of its challenge is prescriptive. Doesn't really ask or allow for creativity. But combat does have a strength. You have to execute every enemy you fell by sucking their sands with your dagger during this lengthy, vulnerable animation, and normally that'd suck. Yeah, it's annoying, but it creates drama. It turns combat into a puzzle, much more in line with the game's other elements, where you need to knock down as many enemies as possible, suck a couple, with them de- cells and keep going to win the war of attrition or tactically assassinate the problem enemy isolate them from the group lure them away it's fairly interesting to experience once you've got a grasp on all available options and to be fair like the platforming segments you can slow time to make things easier rewind deadly blows and situations you could crowd control enemies with a special attack so while there are things to groan about it's pretty inoffensive altogether it's just that the skill gap between platforming and combat clashes a bit so you're left with a game flow that shifts from high to mid consistently like over half my videos, and combat segments are still stuffed with throwaway, scarab beetle bashes, stop and wait bird attacks, you know, no stakes, no fun trash mobs, and the bosses. Holy god. There's only two, the Sand King and the final boss, but uh, I'm gonna keep it real with you, chief. Sand King kinda poo poo sus if you catch my drift. The low boss count probably has more to do with cut content or low developer confidence, to be fair. But this one fight just sucks. It's a typical slog, but this time, the girl you meet early on needs protection from the AI, or you're stuck retrying forever. She won't move away, she just shoots arrows, slowly. Farah, I will kill you myself. Farah's important. She's the only other person that you regularly see. She's the strongest reflection of the universe external to the player, in that sense. She exudes that spunky, can-do, partner-in-justice energy. She's not designed to fit in a harem. That's the prince's game. You know, every time there's an unsolvable problem, she's wiggling through a crack, solving partner puzzles, and none of her implementation is perpetual, right? She fades into the background and lets the player play, pops back in for some dialogue and a puzzle. You gotta respect how she's handled doesn't break the tech, balances the prince's moody sarcasm, won't move in combat. Well, at least she stands for something. <laughs> Her presence in the world is necessary. It makes the world feel slightly alive, slightly hopeful. In a world where war is waged, where your dad's been turned into a sand monster and you gotta kill him, there needs to be some good. The incredible greenery, the intricate architecture, even the flat-faced, low-poly allure of the environments, literally any time you see water. For a game so sad, dry, and cynical, Hope clings, and that's Pharaoh's true value, as the representative of the steady state world. Literally and figuratively what we're fighting for. She transcends any discussion of female sidekick with her symbolic value alone. So I just wanted a moment to pop off about the gameplay narrative tie-in discussion or a Farah, in a word. Oh, there is another normal human that pops up early on uh, at the one puzzle. God, I was afraid oh, yeah, you real were quick. Thing. Why is Can my audio peaking? Any ideas? Sands of Time is one of the best, and I can use a cliche. Here's why. Game's a playable movie. The hot couple, the quest, the crop design, things for hours. The action sequences, the romantic tension, the cinematic angles, the ups and downs, the big bad. Everything about Sands is cinema. It's not a mistake that Prince of Persia got a movie starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Pretty good singer. But outside of improving combat, my first impression was that, shoot, 
Game's got nowhere to go but down. How do you top quality contiguous platforming? How do you trump solid narrative work? You just don't. Okay, grab the wheel, swerve that sh Prince of Persia, Warrior Within is one of the games ever. Warrior Within follows Sands of Time, barely. Tonally, it's, I mean, Whoever that is, he isn't our uwu diapy boy of yore. That guy could kill you. All I'm asking for is some information. And they changed the voice. Apparently Yuri Lowenthal ain't good enough for y'all. Hate round sounds, huh? I had to call in the rasper. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is like if I swapped up my whole ass self for market purposes. It's me. Edgy K-Bash. From now on, we'll be digging deep into the heart of games with our bare hands and cold steel. Why, where are your glasses, K-Bash? Oh, I've no need of those any longer. I see true to the heart of matters with my cold eyes alone. Warrior Within is a pretty transparent attempt to fish up a new audience, and the bait's obvious. It's dripping from the loading screens. It's worth noting that Sans sold well, really well, but not in the States. And you gotta assume, with a shift this drastic, that they wanted the M-rated, hardcore gamer crowd. It kinda worked. Short 500,000 total sales, give or take. But more importantly, it let the team explore new things, you know? People can't dunk on your overtly desert-ass soundtrack when you're switching to Slipknot. Are they serious? With this music? And don't let the new look fool you, it's still concerned with the cinematic. Literally intros with a nautical raid, dudes falling from the crow's nest, holes tearing in the hall, you can spin around in slow-mo. Okay, guys, I'm kinda chubbing right now. Like I said, it's cinematic. Except for that one guy's death, that was... What was that? And all of this, the tone, the edge, is justified by the story's new direction. According to the seer here, the prince is doomed to die because he released the sands of time in the first game. Cheated fate and now the integrity of the timeline needs to be restored by the Dahaka, a hulking shadow monstrosity bent on killing him at every turn. He's been on the run for years and seeks salvation on an island. And that's where we begin. Now, I was excited to play Warrior Within more than the rest because, come on, you can't mess with a cover like that. Look, Edge is good. You just need empathy. Edge doesn't exist because some kid wants to murder his class with a katana. Okay, that's incidental. Edge exists because teenagers are going through it and want to feel competent while looking damaged. They want love and respect, but you can't just ask for that. That's weakness in our really, truly incredible culture. Avatars like this exist for a reason. Unfortunately, because the game's going through puberty, it experiments with some frustrating stuff. Stuff that reminds me of the discrepancies between 2D and 3D Metroid, actually. I love a cropped linear experience, and I get that not everyone feels that way, but when a linear game's working, it feels genius, smart, and satisfying. When a game's more open-ended, the premium design of linearity often surrenders to dead air. Some people find opportunity, or value, or peace, or a time to jerk off in that, but not me. I get bored. Jangle them keys on two years old. Goo goo gaga. <laughs> So Pop turns into a semi-open world experience. You're asked to find your way to various areas, platform along, carve a bloody trail through, and sometimes you end up backtracking. Thankfully, the zones are fairly interconnected. It's weird coming off one, though. Enemies respawn, they've added treasure chests, I unlocked artwork. Oh. And the last game had hidden health upgrades too, but this game locks the true ending and the best sword behind finding them all. So yeah, I'd say we're off to a strained relationship. You know, she's telling me I don't show enough love, I'm telling her she's bought too much stuff. Okay, we don't need all of this junk! STOP SPENDING MONEY! Otherwise, not much has changed. When the gameplay is happening, it's great. It's a linear ride through the levels, because it has to be. Open-ended platforming would change up the whole experience. They expanded the time element slightly. You'll travel between times, a la Oracle of Ages, feel the hueless dread of the present and the color punch of the past. It's a really beautiful environment. The team that handled assets was on it for all these games. Damn. Unfortunately, a huge, Huge chunk of content was cut in the console versions and restored on the PSP. Don't worry, I know. Try it out sometime. PPSSPP runs real good like... Name's hilarious. Now, as you may have expected, combat got the real shakeup. And wow, where do you even begin with this? Okay, thank you. What the fuck? Blood, blades, 
janky mechanics, Warrior Within freed your feet and opened your options. Just being able to move around in 3D space is huge, and that's a single addition. There's a two weapon system now, but all offhand weapons are brittle, so you gotta scavenge constantly, and it's hard to ignore the system. Having two weapons in hand unlocks the more damaging half of your moveset. Yeah, one handed attacks won't cut it, and I mean it, the game requires a power hit or strong move of some kind to actually finish off most enemies. Like in this clip, I'm wailing on the guy with my main hand, but he won't die till I do something with my other hand or do an overhead slash. It's like this sword is better quality. Why does it suck? So you end up comboing with X into Y a lot, spinning around. It's neat, but a little cookie cutter. Not that it's your only option. You can throw your offhand for a free stun or even free kill, depending on what you're holding and a pile of other dial in combos. Man, they even took notes from Ninja Gaiden and let you leap off the walls. I didn't, I'm just, why? Yeah, you can interact with enemies. Yeah, you can interact with the wall, but those inputs are gummy and it's a real blessing that you've got rewind. Like half the time, bouncing off the walls is a mistake caused by jumping on another enemy. It just feels so horrendously jank. Though I like that you can flip over enemies for a stab, kick them off ledges, etc. There's a lot to play around with. And for a game that's lost its rigidity, it's only positive. Now enemy design is, wow. Damn, that's the coolest thing I've seen so far. How are you gonna drop that on me all casual like? And that is the extent of the joy I got from the enemies. There's also a number of special sand powers. My favorite one is this, where the screen goes red, clearly supposed to be an anime rapid slash attack or something like, oh, I don't know, WoW's killing spree ability, but it looks so stupid. Better luck next time, kiddo. <laughs> None of the combat changes were a real problem. They took some getting used to, but overall, it's a welcome shift. The bosses, though, I mean, the game features this one boss fight, like four times, basically, drags the mechanics over across two characters, and at the risk of sounding like a scrub, I mean, why is it so hard? It's just a battle with another dual-wielding assassin. Should make for some cool swashbuckling. But no, we're talking an unblockable kick that can send you off the stage and deals over a quarter of your health. Block strings that look manageable until she pops an instant, unreactable double stab with no warning. Um, this enemy can beat your parry sometimes, and I'm still not entirely sure why. I like this clip where I just gave up, super demoralized. <laughs> Listen. I need you to feel my pain. Bosses have never been this serious strong suit, and how could they be? The combat's basically a highly reactive substance locked in his safe. It's clunky and weird, and if it weren't, it would explode. And the game has at least one good boss, but uh, that's it. I ended up parry spamming or spamming roll attacks to maximize damage. You know, it's rough when I'm trying to cheese the AI to scrape by. And this angry energy infects regular play too. It's a million little piss offs, like getting killed through the floor. <laughs> Why am I dead? Getting lost. These guys who block your path on a balance beam or attack from the walls. Not complicated, just timing sensitive. And then there's the Dahaka, everybody's favorite inclusion. For some reason, the Dahaka shows up to chase the prince through tight platforming sequences. So in other words, you die about two to five times per because it's high pressure and grayscale. And yeah, I like linear platforming too. I hate when the drama of a sequence gets sucked out because I died five times. It's like dying against the final boss until the high energy ending fizzles out. Of course, it's not awful. It's pop. Popcorn's great too. Kernel's still sticking your gums, though. So the story. You're not getting any good Fifi's this time, okay? There is no father, there is no Pharah, and there is no warmth! You're stuck on the Isle of Time looking for the Empress of Time. You're constantly hovered over by shadowy weirdos while the bitch in the red dress tells you where to go. Look at Kylina. Man, tell me you're fishing for peepees without telling me you're fishing for peepees. So, how do you like my dress, Prince? Actually, I prefer feet. It's a noticeably colder game, and that's fine. Now, spoilers here, you discover that the prince exists in two timelines, one where he's himself, and the other where he becomes the Sandwraith, and through some highly improbable means, the issue is reconciled. <laughs> It's revealed that Kylina isn't even really a human, just a byproduct of the gods creating the sands of time. I guess that's why she's got all that lipstick on a crumbling remote island. It's hard to talk narrative here because the game gates its true ending behind completion. You either cheat the hole or don't and successfully cheat fate again either way. Now I know what you're thinking, but can I sleep with Kylina? Yes. 
Yeah, I don't know what else to say about Warrior Within. That game's a wreck. That game reminds me of people who just get sloppy on the weekends at 35. If that sounds close enough to you, try it on out. Don't let old man K-Bash poo-poo your trash. Because my favorite did the worst, and uh, that just blows. Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones, introduced The Dark Prince, officially making it a game about a YouTuber being harassed by his dark half to play Sonic 06 or something. Okay, Bash, hit his eye. Uh. Evil Bash. <laughs> Man, I haven't had to do this since 2018. It was my late introduction to Pop, a game that looked back at its past and improved in the face of criticism, a game that sharpened the formula to a razor sheen. I still have no idea how it's not the fan favorite. So, let's get into some of that holistic game critique. Two Thrones is a homecoming for the trilogy in more than a few ways. The prince returns to his country after years on the run. He meets with old characters, both the vizier and Farah from Sands of Time. The gameplay immediately abandons the contiguous world of Warrior Within for the segmented linearity of the first. And despite the return to form, what appears like an attempt to emulate the success of the first game, the prince returns triumphantly with his edge, but tempered, his maturity intact. Early on, his arm fuses with a chain-like weapon, the Dagger Tail, and he loses his princely shirt, leaving him exactly how I want to look like. Wow! One can dream. Or work for it. Hmm. So the game's a reconciliation of identities, or in plain terms, peanut butter on chocolate. And while some people are allergic to one, the other, or both, that's just the way that series crumble. This game apparently shot near a million under the original, and I think that's f***ing tragic considering. Sure, maybe not enough is different to sell a third game, but these systems are good. It's really rare that a platforming game feels rewarding for me, and I think it's that sweet spot combination of quality animation and varied but understandable but and sequencing. It's always getting more involved, game over game. Okay, it's a process. I like having the wall run here, and jump, and press B, and wall run again, and it all flows together so smoothly in these beautifully rendered environments. Game takes your breath away, like who cares about ray tracing, bro? Can we go back to this? And that rewind feature, man, that single button was enough to carry the gameplay of three major AAA titles. It's so small and it makes these games feel premium. Oh, that never gets old. Beyond being a fusion of concepts, Two Thrones manages to explore some specific design space for the prince that really should have been previously. I mean, look at the guy. He may be shredded, but he's not a tank. He's agile and dexterous. He fits the rogue archetype better than anything. So where, in the earlier games, is the rogue gameplay? It's especially noticeable in Warrior Within, and like, yeah, I get it, but you'd come across enemies ambiently, facing away, so why can't I stab the kidney? Two Thrones introduce stealth elements and assassinations. Admittedly, the stealth is primitive. If you're facing an enemy, they're gonna see you almost guaranteed, and the game doesn't do much to assist the player here. It's the rewind feature or bust, but the stealth is never actually required, just a neat addition, and that, my friends, makes it a choice. Starting a stealth kill prompts back-to-back quick-time events to land the death blow. It's not super difficult thanks to Rewind, and it looks awesome. Though learning it early can be annoying, because it mostly amounts to sitting until the game lets you go. It's not terribly skill intensive, but still, get impatient and you're gonna get schmacked. I really appreciate rogue gameplay where I can get it, but uh, what's that? Oh my god. Oh, oh, oh my god! The Dark Prince, the major gameplay shakeup more or less filling in for the Dahaka segments. So the prince gets infected by the sands of time, I guess, and now he's fighting for control with his inner darkness. Sometimes the darkness gets out and his health drains continuously. And wow, there's a really tight and enjoyable platforming section just in time to take my attention off the anxiety of my depleting health. Damn, his whip kicks ass, makes combat mashy and fun, and it keeps topping my health up to boot. Like, this concept is bizarre, because as a kid, it was endlessly anxious, but nowadays it's just a fun challenge. And you can tell the designers went out of their way to make these segments fast, flowing, and fun. It's respectable, and it doesn't involve getting chased by some big dumb asshole, right? I'm in control of my fate here. Perhaps because the prince has broken the chain of fate twice now, and that narrative element is reflected in gameplay? 
Just thinking out loud. Two Thrones returns to the Pharah Helper thing as well. I guess you could say it's the least lonely entry, but your relationships are strained. Pharah and the prince go through their own drama regarding the chain arm. Pharah, what's the matter? You can't hug me with that chain in your arm. It hurts. Ouchie ouch. Oh, truly I am untouchable and unlovable. Oh. Otherwise, things are just like before. She'll help you through some puzzles, but nothing as consistently as the first game. Eventually, she gets damseled anyway, so... Aside from some cinematic segs, plot lubrication, the rare overlong puzzle, the only thing unmentioned is... No! Not you again, no! Finally mastering video game structure trademark, Two Thrones ends each major section of the game with a boss. Instead of offering purely combat mechanics bosses, it wisely opts for a platforming boss. Man, that thing's straight out of Resident Evil. Did they make El Gigante X It? Well, that's not fair at all. There's the boss ripped from Warrior Within, but at least you gotta use your sand powers and the Dark Prince to beat it down. It's not totally miserable anymore. And the two gladiator guys, so you gotta lure around and play like a rogue to beat. Great fight, love to see it. For once, I'm not complaining about the bosses, because while they've got their stumbling block moments, while they're annoying in different ways, they all need to be handled differently. I'll ask the player to exercise different skills taught by the game. It took this long. Game 3 to finally make varied and interesting boss fights. That of course leaves the final boss, but first a word on the story. I don't like spending a ton of time on the story in games like this. Like yeah, Thief 3 demonstrates a typical hero's journey, but it doesn't make the story notable or interesting, it's boilerplate. And that's basically Prince of Persia in a nutshell. Now far be it from me to insult the work of the writers. They clearly did their homework on the source material, they drew their connections, and they know they're writing for what is, essentially, an action movie in game form. So the prince monologues in his free time all through the first game, bounces off Farah and improves. But something goes wrong. He's worse for wear in Warrior Within, and the only other people around are hostile. His monologues are more justified. He's haunted, fraught with loneliness and despair. But he succeeds in his quest, only to find his homeland ravaged, his lover slain, his old friend unsure of who he is, actively against what he's becoming, his soul withering. The tale is simple and compelling. It succeeds at what it's trying to do as a trilogy. Raising the stakes where appropriate, creating drama when necessary, demonstrating the prince's gradual maturation, and constantly redefining the few character relationships that exist to match the scenario. It's solid. The time thing is just dressing. A little elbow grease for this story. So it's not an issue when the vizier is back in demigod form, when Farah is turned into a damsel. It's time for the prince to show that the games were worth something, what he learned, that he can prove himself to his old friend. And he does. I mean, the boss fight sucks. Doing an unnecessarily tight sequence of quick time events into literal platforming hell ain't my definition of fun, but you know, at the top of the mountain, when it's all in the past, it's not bad. The Prince of Persia name didn't end with the trilogy, however, clean as it was. While the IP more or less surrendered to Assassin's Creed, just God help you, Ubisoft. They took steps to reshape and rebrand the series. At some point it was obvious that Pop was bleeding money or didn't generate enough interest. It's hard to tell when something genuinely degraded over time existed at the wrong time or was only wanted one time. Whatever the case, this smooth modern take on genuine gaming history took a very strange turn. Dulled the blades, polished the walls, put on a shirt, Drop the M rating. And that's not even considering the spin-offs. But that is a tale for another time. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons whose names are on the screen. The show's finally getting somewhere thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welsh, Alex, Andy Blar, Arch, Basement Dweller, BZ Soul, Ben M, Boha, Brios, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wave, Caesar T, Cordis, Christo, Cody Gold, Couch Mo, Corgi the Lad, Crater, CW Glassworks, Cyrus, Daddy Dago, Don Dino, Dakota Storm Jones, Dakey Stag, Swaggy, David Bet, Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Dead, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Funk, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Aesthetico, Exa, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyph Seeker, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's 
crack house, Arkosh. demon, game and station, Max, you ingenious clown, I punched a sandwich, irradiated cherries, dice Kyle, it's time to sue, wow. Ivy, Ruth Langley, James, Jason Lasky, Jaden, Jay Dayas, Joke Frog, Jordan Joyner, Keegan Too Cool, Clock Crazy, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Ice, Latrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Juan, Low Fat Mogul, Lucas Boy, Lucky McSmucky, Magical Madman, Markule, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Mike DeVere, Milky Moo Official, Monochrome Only, Mr. Dodongo, Nairanu, Nito Torpedo, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, Booga Booga, Complaint, Pandemic Cowboy, Pinata, PK Gaming, Potato Gaming HD, Quasar McDougal, Quillwork, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Sagittarius, Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Sam Vertigo, Scribe Slendy, Sakai No Awarda, Shot, Silver Bear 909, Sim. God! Sleepy Wabbit. Suckdolager. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squishward. Starbound. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Catanova. Super Sandwich Guy. Sean Chubbington. The Big Bubby. The Salt Knight. Big Dick Mystic. Drips Hartrock. Timid the Writer. Travis Edwards. Trevingsley. Twiddle Chungus. Vid. Venom. Vice Pop. Viewers Like You. Vic. Waposa. Weed Trash. Well, shit. Where am I? Help! Winter Solstice. Zanny Tanner. Yay, Kundo. Zachary Lives. Zachary V. Zanasso. Zane. The Impure, Zane the Pure, Zeradax, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zero Zalazar, Silvlin Ray, Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got all kinds of goals and lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.